Hello, this is John Kranz. I want to welcome you to this, our first Consum World webinar. I want to also thank you for attending and ask for your patience. This is the first time we've done this, so obviously we'll be learning as we go here, and as we learn, we'll be sure to make the webinar experience as enjoyable as possible moving forward. So again, this is uh, Napoleonic 20 series uh, from Victory Games. Our speakers, will, Victory Point Games, our speakers will be Alan Emmerich publisher and Lance McMillan, series developer. But before we start today's webinar broadcast, I want to go through just some house cleaning items to help you understand how you can participate as an attendee. So if you see here, uh, we have a Constant World webinar attendee view, and that's composed of two windows. The window, the larger window on the left is the actual presentation screen. That is the screen that is being shared and being used by a presenter, and you'll be, uh, we'll be using that quite a bit today. Most importantly is the uh, control panel that is pictured to the right. That is an area that you can use to... Uh, uh, participate in today's webinar. So I just want to st spend a few moments going through some of the features of the control panel. So first, as we take a close-up view of the control panel here, you'll see that we have a arrow that you can go ahead and select to open or collapse your panel. So by clicking on that arrow, you can basically expand the view. That gives you the various options. No, how you're joining us today, uh, you can uh, also change under the view menu, you can deselect the auto hide the control panel option. That way the control panel will always be visible to you during the presentation if you uncheck the auto hide the control panel. So I just want to mention that feature. For audio, we will give you the opportunity if you'd like to speak or ask any questions. We have a way we can allow that. We just need to know that you are able to connect to audio. So you can either be using your computer for that or you could have dialed in by telephone. And here are the options where you can go ahead and select how you want to be connected via audio. Please note, however, that if you are going to be using the telephone, you need to enter your audio PIN. The audio pin is the only way we can select you and unmute your uh, phone so we can have you speak uh, today. And then also, uh, just as important as raising your hand to ask questions, you have a questions panel. So at the end of today's session, we will go through all the questions that you have entered in this box. So please feel free at any point during today's webinar, please enter your questions in this area, and we'll be sure to review all the questions at the close of today's presentation. So again, you can add, it, add your questions here or simply raise your hand. Uh, as I mentioned here, there's a button icon that's highlighted here in red. You can raise your hand and as we, we will call on you if you want to go ahead and ask a question. And again, we'll be addressing those questions uh, at the end of today's Q&A se session that you enter through the control panel. And we will also make this available as a recording. So at any point, we'll have on-demand webinars available to you. And we will post and announce on the Constant World News Desk when this recording becomes available to view again. So again, I want to thank you for joining today. And at this point, I'm going to hand things over to Alan Emmerich of Victory Point Games. Alan? Well, gosh, thanks, John. Um, this whole webinar thing is kind of new and exciting. I want to introduce the series developer for the Napoleonic 20 games, and that's Lance McMillan. Howdy. How's everybody doing tonight? Hey, Lance. And I need to apologize in advance in case I uh, sound like a cartoon character. If I come off sounding like Sylvester the Cat, uh, it's because of my uh, Bell's palsy, which is slowly receding away. should be gone by Consim World. For all of you attending there, I'll see you at Consum World Expo. But uh, if I make funny sounds with my Fs and Ss and things, that's uh, that's not me trying to crack wise. It's just a fun disease I'm enjoying right now. But uh, onward with Napoleonic 20. I guess I should introduce the, uh, the the series and how it all started at Victory Point Games. Uh, when Victory Point Games was nothing but a, uh, a glint in my eye with the desire to have uh, an outlet for my students to get some hands-on experience making games, uh, I mean, they all graduate with killer portfolios, but what they really need is a portfolio um, with experience to get a job. Oh, it looks like I'm showing my screen now. Lucky me. All right. Um, 
one of the things I did was I called for uh, games from my friends, and I got Jim Dunnigan to donate his Drive on Mets uh, game from his book, you know, the Complete War Games Handbook. I got uh, Christopher Cummins to uh, contribute Strike Force One, also designed by Jim Dunnigan. And I called Joe Miranda, and I said, Joe, you don't have any uh, little tiny war games, do you? I mean, you know, not a big S&T size, but something a little uh, smaller. And he did. He had um, a game he did for the Strategist Newsletter back in 1999, and it was called Waterloo 20. And I'd never seen it. He sent me some uh, Mimeo copies of what it was. And I looked at it, and it was a very small game. It had an 8.5 by 11 map and 20 pieces, sure enough, just like you said. But I saw that we could really get something new out to the public, something they hadn't seen before, uh, I expected, and that was Waterloo 20. That's really what tipped the scales and got Victory Point games started, because now I had something really cool and new to offer. And I, I put a lot of work into this. Um, you were going to see my, my terrible handmade map that I did in Microsoft Word, um, but uh, fortunately John Cooper ran into what I was doing, and he contributed the great artwork that we had to launch this game with. What made Waterloo 20 what it became is something Joe Miranda put in as a throwaway item. I was looking through the terrain effects chart, and there's forests, and there's rivers, and towns, and rough terrain. And I called up Joe and I said, Joe, why is there a rough terrain on the terrain effects chart? There's no rough terrain on the map. And he said, well, that's, you know, just in case I put some on or, you know, there was another game. Well, that's all he had to say. Another game? Wait a minute, what? We could do this with other stuff? And then the light goes on and it's like, well, sure. Why don't we find some other game this would be perfect for? And then that got me working on Yena 20, and since you can't launch a series with just like two games, I figured, you know, thinking like Charles Roberts, you got to launch with three at least. Then I started working on Albion 20 and Smolensk 20, and uh, those are the ones that, that have my fingerprints all over them. It was at about that time when I was working on Yena 20, which I tried to get Joe Miranda to do, because, you know, obviously you want the genius luminary to do the design. Well, Joe was really busy with other projects, and he said, Alan, just do it. It'll be easy. It'll be fun. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, I was working on Yena 20, and that's when I ran into Lance McMillan, who, with a you know single email, moved the critical terrain features around on the map to make it realistic, fixed about a million little things that I had wrong with it, and suddenly Yena 20 looked pretty good. And uh, in typical VTG fashion, if you show any aptitude for anything, you get drafted doing it. Lance became the series developer for the Napoleonic 20 series. And a really great war game developer Lance is. He's taken the series in hand. Each game offers something new, something different. Joe was really proud when I took his random events table in Waterloo 20 and uh, added event cards. He had a random events table, and I said, well, Joe, let's uh, show off what Victory Point games can do. One of the things we can do is put a little sheet of 12 cards in the game. And uh, so I made up, well, these are the uh, new set edition cards, but I made up a set of 12 cards. And the fact that the cards were not just give, giving random events, they were also narrating the story. And the way they were used and the, the reshuffling and stuff, you know, on night turns and things, made it really work. And I think that's one of the keys that makes the Napoleonic 20 system work. Okay. So that's the story behind the game. Uh, what you're looking at is uh, second edition Waterloo 20. Second edition, by the way, is uh, we just launched uh, second edition about an hour before this seminar started. So if you uh, want to Trottle on over to Victory Point Games. You can see the new second edition. This is also the edition that we're sending off to GMT to include in the Fading Glory pack, but I guess there'll be more on that later. All right, Lance, what's next on the agenda? What are we supposed to do? Well, uh, let me give you a quick rundown on the, uh, the various titles in the series. And uh, 
what each one of them added to the, the series. Okay. As, as Alan pointed out, uh, I came on board with Yena 20. I had uh, no involvement with the original Waterloo. And uh, my involvement came because I was just skimming through the, uh, the various folders on Consim World and stumbled across the one about uh, the Napoleonic 20 games. At that time, I think it just said Waterloo 20. And uh, they were discussing problems they were having with Yena, uh, the battle just not flowing the right way. It wasn't following the historical path. Uh, typically, the French were just sweeping around the uh, Prussian left flank. And I looked at the map and just said, you know, I, uh, I drove past Jena last year when I was visiting Germany, and uh, to my eye, you have a hill out of position. And if you move that hill, uh, you ought to solve your problems. So if you look at the map that uh, Alan's showing on the screen right now, you see there's a little rough terrain hex in 0607 there next to uh, Jena. Well, originally, I believe it was over in, like, 907 or something. So they moved it, and the very next game, for the first time ever, the, uh, the game flowed correctly, and the French didn't go sweeping around the Prussian left. They drove in from the center. And for the gift of a hill, a game was saved. Yeah, and it, the important thing was it wasn't even that the Prussians had to occupy the hill defensively. Just because the terrain restricted movement was enough to change the dynamic of the game. So that was a really eye-opening event to me that something, a small tweak like that, could make such a big difference. And the, uh, the difference in unit values, too, was remarked in Yena with the uh, super strong Imperial Guard and French Third Corps. I remember that, but it all held together because the Prussians had a lot of little guys they could concentrate. Here you see some of uh, John Cooper's stunning artwork. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, <laughs> the game doesn't use counters that size. <laughs> well, come on. Uh, they're even smaller in the C3I edition, so at least we got that beat. Yeah. All so right. Anyway, after Yena, um, we did, I believe it was, uh... Albion next? Yep. Now, Albion is interesting because it's the one game in the series that has what I consider a mistake, which I will ensure never gets repeated. And again, you got to remember this is the third, only the third game in the series. So we're still starting to learn. Uh, what we did there was we allowed a cavalry to be designated as a, an elite unit. And uh, the reason oh, we did that? I'm sorry. That would, that would have been my fault. <laughs> well, you know, nobody knew, nobody caught it. But the big thing was because of the effect of uh, elite status on a unit, and if you put it in a fortress, like as shown on the map here, Dover, uh, Basically, you can't force the guy to retreat. It sits there indefinitely. The horse guard, I see. So, yeah, exactly. So that was a, a, a learning experience. Uh, it's also an interesting game because the reinforcement schedule in this uh, particular edition is that you really don't have much control if you're the French player or what forces you're getting or when. You sort of they come in by these die rolls. Well, it's also you draw them randomly, so you don't know whether you're getting any, and if you do get some, they sort of show up by random pull. So it was a, it's a fun, fun situation because it's very chaotic. So after Albion was my first design, which was Borodino, and Borodino introduced artillery units for the first time, Cossacks, militia. It also introduced uh, the pontoon bridges, which have shown up in many other games. Uh, it's interesting for Borodino because that was the game that started us discussing whether or not we needed to do a second edition of the rules because we'd had so many things added and changed. Excuse me, Lance? So, yeah. Uh, we have a few people reporting that they're having trouble hearing you, so you might want to try speaking up or if you can increase your microphone volume, anything you can do, and I appreciate those okay. letting, letting me know they're having trouble hearing you. Thank you. Sure. Hopefully uh, this is a little better for everybody. I don't know. Uh, 
Just let John know if you're having an issue. Sounds good to me, Lance. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so after we finished with Borodino, the next game was Smolensk, which was an expansion kit, the first expansion kit in the, uh, the series. And it basically used the same counter set from the, uh, the Borodino game, but on a completely different map with a completely different set of cards and such. Uh, it's also the first game where we introduced uh, terrain that only one side was able to use until certain events had occurred. Uh, there's a ford near the city of Smolensk, which initially only the Russians know about, but the French can just discover via a card pull. And, right. Uh, it, can, it can occasionally be a critical factor in getting uh, the French to cross the river. So those were the first five releases that all came out in 2008. Uh, moving on to 2009, we had another five releases. Uh, there was Busako, Austerlitz, the expansion kit, which included the game Gazatsk, Vitoria, and Dresden. Now, each of those had little things that they added to the system again. Uh, Busako was the first game where we formally split the designation of guard and elite units. It used to be in the original uh, set of rules that they were synonymous terms, just had slightly different effects. But then we suddenly realized that it was possible to have elite units that weren't guards and vice versa. And we also added in light infantry units, which have sort of the same ability to a lesser degree of what cavalry have in terms of being able to disengage from combat. Uh, Austerlitz is Kim Mainz's first design. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Anyway, uh, Kim came up with this really, I, this is, I'll be honest, my favorite game in the whole series. I think it's one of the few games that captures the, the true nuance of Napoleon's brilliance at this battle. Uh, because it, it doesn't force feed you into a situation where you have to make the same attacks and approaches and binds the allied player with EDC rules to do something he knows isn't going to work. Instead, it allows a, a randomized setup, and you can try different attempts uh, at different flanks and turning maneuvers and so forth. It, uh, it, just, it really all comes together in this game. And yeah, what I really noticed with, that you did in Austerlitz 20 was that you took a system and not just made it a set of mechanics on a map, but you tried to work into the more player decisions. People could actually explore what ifs. And that's one of the, the hallmarks I saw that you really started to do as a developer, is to say, where are the what ifs in this game, and how do we let players explore them? And, and I see that more and more, and I really like that. Thank you. So after Austerlitz was the expansion kit, with the Gazotsk. Uh, briefly on Gazotsk, it's the second of the games in the series that is a, a battle that never occurred, the first being Albion. Uh, it was the, the motivation behind that design for my part was when I was reading some source material for Borodino's design and there was a discussion how the Russians had actually started entrenching for a couple of days at this at this battlefield, and uh, the, the Battle of Borodino, the big cataclysmic battle before Moscow, could very well have occurred here rather than at Borodino. But uh, court politics dictated that uh, they fall back and ended up fighting at Borodino. But this was the supposed perfect battlefield. So I wanted to give players between Smolensk and Borodino and Gazatz the opportunity to see how the same two armies performed on very different battlefields. Uh, Gazatz also included uh, the ability for the Russian player to choose where he would deploy his entrenchments and fortifications, because he's doing that for the few days before the battle starts, he's deciding where he's going to dig in. 
the expansion kit that came with this also included a number of other interesting things, the what we call maneuver matrix, which is trying to give a little more tactical feel to the combat resolution. I understand from a lot of people that uh, it's not something they particularly like, but we gave the option, and there are some people who really like it and feel that it adds to the system. But it's kind of a little matrix, and you, you choose a tactic for each battle, or you can choose just one battle for each uh, turn or whatever. The other thing it added were some additional uh, special event cards that uh, you, rather than just drawing one every turn, if you draw one of these, in a lot of cases you get to keep it and play it at a later time, uh, giving a special effect uh, that you, you know and your opponent doesn't know is about to hit or something. It also added in something we called half morale points because there was a sense among some people, most notably Alum, that... Hey. Uh, Losing a one-point unit shouldn't have cost as much as losing a, uh, a two, three, or four-point unit. So that's why we uh, we tried that. And my understanding is uh, the most popular part of the expansion kit are the keeper cards. Uh, the other two uh, are less used. After the expansion kit and gazettes, we did Vittoria. That was Kim's second game design. Uh, it included the baggage train and some interesting things about uh, Spanish morale, making their troops a little more fragile than the, the rest of the uh, British Army. And then came Dresden. Dresden is the first of the large games in the series. It has a map which is uh, about 50% longer than one of the normal maps in the game, uh, in the series. And it really expanded the idea of variable entry. Up to this point, sometimes games allowed you to say you were going to bring your reinforcements on in area A or area B, but once you made that choice, you were just kind of stuck with it. Um, when you got to Dresden, it was a much more strategic, almost a pre-game game, where the French player had to decide where his reinforcements were going to enter and in what sequence they were going to enter and which one of the reinforcement groups had priority to come in first. So as you see from the graphic that Alan's showing right now, you've got A, B, and C entry areas for the French. So the French player would choose to, for example, enter his reinforcements first at area B and they would arrive two turns ahead of the next group which might come in at area C and finally the third group would come in four turns after the first one at area A or you could just say you're not bringing any reinforcements in at all at area C. So there was a whole strategic approach mini game that went on. Well all the other Dresden games I've played have been about the Battle of Dresden and their maps have basically focused around this town and the campaigning just outside. What I liked about what you did with Dresden in this game, Lance, is that you made it the campaign. It, it felt like I was making larger decisions than, than just what was happening on that map and all the other Dresden games I played. Now I was approaching to maneuver. Now I could you know, look at the situation Napoleon was facing and say, well, I think I could just hold on at Dresden. Rather than concentrate my whole army there, let's see if I can hang on and send a flanking force down entry area B or C and try and really close the trap, the, the, the bolder plan that Napoleon was looking at. I like that. Yeah, thank you. And the, the Allies similarly have a f couple small choices like that. They have reinforcements that come in either at Y or Z, and depending on what the French do, they can actually choose to not have their reinforcements come in at all and use them to block the French uh, supply lines, which has an in-game effect of reducing their morale recovery at night. So it's a much more strategic approach to the game. And as I alluded to, it's also the first of the games in what we're calling the, the Germany 20 sub-series. And the idea here was to take all the principal battles that occurred during the autumn 1813 campaign and have them linkable so you could play the games in series and have the outcome of one effect 
how your starting setup would be in the next game. So those were the five games that came out in 2009. In 2010, we had three games. Those were all of them part of the Germany 20 series, sub-series. Uh, that was Kotzbach, Grossbieren, and Kulm. Now, Kotzbach introduced unreliable troops, which is troops that before they engage in combat, you roll to see if they're going to perform at uh, full efficiency or reduced efficiency. Uh, Gross Biren took the idea of variable reinforcements to new extremes. Oh, the, uh, as you're showing, I'm glad you put that there. I'd forgotten that. This is perhaps my favorite part of Kotzbach, uh, the, the show now issue. Um, there's kind of a, a mini battle occurring just off to the south end of the map. And both players have reasons to withdraw their troops or leave them in place down there to fight that mini battle. Uh, and if they withdraw them, they can reinforce their forces on the main battlefield here. So it's, again, a conscious choice for the players of uh, a strategic approach to how they're going to fight the battle. Now, just what I really liked about these Germany 20 games that lead to the big battles of Dresden and then later Leipzig is that there are really so few units, and your decisions are so huge with them. It's just great. It's, it's like chess-like almost. Yeah, and Kotzbach, if I recall correctly, I think the French have four units and the Allies have six. So, yeah, every, every move, every choice you make has huge implications on how things are going to flow. Yeah, and they play right quick. Um, anyway, Gross -Biren. Gross -Biren, yeah, Gross Biren introduced uh, the idea of variable reinforcements taken to new extremes. Almost literally from the first game in the whole Napoleonic 20 series, we've had units that didn't actually fight in the historical battle being able to show up as possible reinforcements. It was kind of a, a draw this card, and uh, you may, if you get the right die roll, get the unit. But at Gross Baron, there were so many other columns approaching this battlefield, or potentially approaching the battlefield, that I wanted to show the uncertainty of it. So you now have cases where you draw a card which is kind of a prerequisite to drawing another card to allow reinforcements to come in. And the, uh, the fight can get very unpredictable of who's arriving when and where. Yeah, knowing when to, to charge forward with your army and when to pull back is huge in this game. Yeah, and this one, like Kotzbach, is very small armies. Uh, again, the French only have four units. I think the Allies have five in this case. And uh, with the rein possible reinforcements that come in, it almost doubles the numbers on each side. Okay, so what was... The next one was Kolm. Now, Kolm is by itself a fairly tough battle to model because it really would involve one unit on the French side against about a dozen units on the Allied side. So I wanted to show a much larger perspective. So this game is capable of being played as a standalone or the top hex row on this map happens to also be the bottom hex row on the Dresden map. So the maps actually overlap and you can link the two together and play Dresden and assuming you precipitate an allied defeat and they start withdrawing, you can then go into the pursuit phase which brings into play uh, the Kulm game. And it shows the difficulty of what's going on of trying to pursue, the French trying to pursue the allied armies through the mountains and at the same time holding a considerable number of their troops in reserve because they're not exactly sure how the other two battles, Gross Buren and uh, Kotzbach, are going to turn out. So as happened historically, the French player is going to be constrained in how flexible he can use all of his available troops. So the, those were the three games from 2010. In 2011, we released four more games into the series. 
two of those, well, excuse me, three of those were part of the Germany 20 series, and that was Denowitz, Gorlitz, and of course the monster uh, Leipzig. And uh, there's also Berzina in there for 2011. Now, Denowitz is an expansion that links two games into it, uh, both Dresden and Grossbira. And you can determine what reinforcements show up for the French based on how well the outcome of Dresden was. And the player really doesn't know before starting play how much of uh, how much aid Napoleon's going to send him. So he has to kind of temper how aggressively he advances with some sort of foreknowledge of <laughs> how little or much he's going to be getting from the emperor. Uh, Gorlitz is the third might-have-been battle in the series. Um, in that case, it was uh, Blücher pursuing MacDonald's defeated army after the Kotzbach. A battle nearly developed until Blücher realized that Napoleon was coming on the scene with the bulk of the Grand Army, and he quickly pulled out away before the battle began. But uh, it's very possible that a major battle could have developed there. Uh, so we use that in the series as uh, a way to explore what could have happened if uh, the results of other battles had gone differently. And then Leipzig? Very, I'm sorry? And then Leipzig? Well, uh, between Gorlitz and Leipzig, we actually had Berzina come out. That was another oh. Kim design. All right. Um, this one added in stragglers, zero strength units that uh, pretty much dissolve on contact. Uh, it's basically the French trying to retreat out of the frozen wastes of Russia, and the Russians trying to... Uh, wake themselves up in time to catch them before they get away. It also has interesting rules for bridges collapsing. The, uh, the bridges were thrown together kind of on the fly out of very shod shoddy materials and kept collapsing into the water during the course of the uh, retreat. Now this also hooks into Borodino 20, right? Because that's the base counter set. That's correct. All right. This is a little publisher's note. We're probably going to put all the Russia 20 games together in a, in a pack at some point here in the future and uh, make it a little, like, quadra game. And then the last game published uh, for 2011 was Leipzig. And that's, that's the a monster. big one. Yeah. Big, big game. Uh, Leipzig introduced, uh, among other things, two new subsystems which could easily be transported to any of the other games in the series, uh, leadership and fatigue. And both of these were introduced because we needed to capture various special aspects of the battle at Leipzig. And we just kind of came up with systems that worked for this battle, but it turns out in retrospect, that they could very easily work for the uh, the entire series. So the the leaders kind of focus combat into certain specific areas. It doesn't prevent you from fighting anywhere. It just makes uh, the combat where the leader is more likely to succeed. Um, the fatigue rules were something we came up with because this is a long battle. It's five days long. The the longest other game in the series is only three, but even you know, those three-day battles, if you look at the historical records, there's kind of a, uh, a flow to the battles of a day of intense fighting and then a day of no fighting or relative calm, followed by yet another day of intense fighting. And the fatigue rules encourage the players to flow in that same way in a non-intrusive manner so they can still continue to push their troops it just becomes more difficult to do so so what you tend to find is after you fought for a while you pull back and let your troops rest to get them back to full efficiency 
Um, Leipzig also had a lot of stuff that expanded on uh, how troops enter. Um, you have main bodies of armies and detachments from armies and that kind of thing. But again, the whole idea was to give a more strategic, larger level feel to the game. And that pretty much takes us up to where we are right now. And, uh, and where we are with uh, the second edition for Waterloo. And, uh, I'll let Alan talk to that. Great. And, uh, I yeah, I'm believe that, yeah, I'm I here. believe that John also has a poll that he's going to post. Yeah, I thought I'd just like to take a moment. Uh, you did a great job uh, providing an overview, Lance. Thanks for doing that, covering so many games in the series. You can see how rich the series is. But let's take a moment to allow the audience. Uh, I'm going to ask the audience in a moment where they can click the uh, hand-raising button. There's a little toolbar control panel we talked about earlier. You're going to see a little hand button you can press. Basically, it means you can raise your hand, and I will call on you, and we will unmute your sound so you can speak. Uh, with Alan or Lance and ask a direct question. Otherwise, I want to thank uh, Alan, Noel, and Keith for uh, submitting questions, which we'll get to as well. You can, you can add your questions to the question panel at any time, so I appreciate you doing that. But this time, we're going to go ahead and ask the uh, first poll question for today. And I think, Lance, perhaps this is something uh, that you can go ahead and introduce. And I understand some people from the pre-registrations haven't played uh, any of these games yet, so perhaps some people will not be uh, answering this question. But I'll go ahead and launch the question now. So, yeah, so this, go ahead, Lance. Thanks. So I was going to say, I, I asked uh, John to put this question up because it's one of the big questions that keeps coming up in testing and between Alan and I and uh, Joe Miranda about whether or not the fog of war rules that are used as part of the standard Napoleonic 20 system or something that m the players like to use. Or Great. So we have about 50% of people... I'll go ahead, go ahead, Lance. I'm sorry. Continue, please. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's an optional rule that you can play with or without as you prefer. We just were wondering what the general overall preference among the player base was. Okay. Well, at this point, we're at about 68% of the people have voted that are on the phone, so I'll hold the poll question open for about another 15 seconds, and then we'll close the poll out. So again, feel free to answer the question. There is an option to say you've never played any of the games as well, so hopefully everybody can uh, select something, and I will close the poll in about five seconds. Yeah, the whole fog of war rule uh, came into happen when um, Joe Miranda did the first Waterloo 20 game, and I said, well, what should I put on the back of the counters, Joe? Uh, the, the setup hex number or something? And uh, he said, well, no, it'd be easy to make a fog of war rule where you just put the flag on the back, and, and we can have them operate around. Because, you know, you've got extra counters. Why don't we use some as dummies so you can have decoys? And I said, okay, well, let me write up a fog of war rule and uh, fly that by you tomorrow. And uh, I did, and we basically have been... Uh, having that ever since, where you can operate with your counters flipped over on their flag side and uh, close in and, and discover what you've run into. And as you can see, we have the results posted now. Uh, we have uh, presently there's 20 people attending, over 80% voted. And uh, good news for you, Alan and Lance. Half the people haven't played any games yet, so a good opportunity to... <laughs> evangelize the system, which is great. I think this is a great number to see. And we have a pretty even split with everybody else. Okay. So I'll go, I'll go ahead and hide that question so we can continue on. And at this point, if anybody does have any questions they want to ask over the phone, you can proceed by hitting the raise hand icon. If you raise your hand by hitting that icon, I will then be able to select you, and you can uh, ask a question over audio or over the phone. So I'll just wait a moment to see if anybody decides to uh, click the hand icon to uh, raise their hand here. So we'll just pause for a moment. Okay. I was thinking while we're, while we're waiting, Alan can talk about uh, Waterloo 20. Okay. Well, yeah. I've got a question already. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank uh, Steve Rawling for calling in. I'm going to unmute his phone, and uh, we'll see if we can get him to uh, go ahead and ask his question. All right, Steve. Yes, this is uh, Steve from Against the Odds. Thank you for the uh, show so far. It's been very smooth watching it at this end, uh, rather polished and professional performance. Are you using any sort of special equipment, or do you have an Uber computer with 
the latest technology in order to get everything to render quickly, or, or how, how much pre-planning went into this? Oh, uh, well, Alan, you can touch upon that. Perhaps it's best coming from you because you're a publisher, and of course I'm very interested to get publishers or designers or developers or historians interested in presenting. So why don't we go with your perspective and Lance's perspective of what the experience has been like for you up to now. Uh, well, gosh, I'm just using the regular old computer I use at the office, which, you know, got a, about a year and a half ago. It was just, you know, your basic $1,100 computer. I mean, there's nothing special about it. It runs, I'm running Adobe uh, Illustrator CS4 is what you're looking at. And there's uh, a lot of gamers with a lot more hot rotted rigs. I, I'm just doing a little show and tell opening up my Illustrator files. I mean, in, in theory, I could show you actually how we make the maps and stuff now. I mean, this is the tool I use to, you know, change the course of rivers, to, to relocate towns. Uh, but it's, it's not not a particularly hot rotted computer. I think it's the Centrix go to webinar software that's making it all really work so well. Yeah, I think what you've got there, Alan, is uh, it's basically showing a screen capture of what's on your screen is what they're seeing. Yeah, this is just my computer that I use at work. I mean, there's nothing that special about it. And uh, just to jump in, uh, Stephen, as you probably know, this. Uh, this came about really thanks to our members uh, from the donation drive. So uh, with the donations we received, we were able to uh, consider launching new services to support the community. So uh, we invested uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, solution from Citrix. So obviously this is a learning lesson for all of us, uh, being the first one. But uh, I think what's exciting about this, uh, besides having a live audience, that these are all going to be on-demand seminars or webinars. So anybody can watch them at any time. Uh, whenever it's uh, comfortable for them. I even had an email this morning from somebody in Europe saying, I donated, but i got to tell you, the webinars aren't really that much value to me because I, I can never see any of your webinars. And I, he was very excited and I responded back when I told him, well, these are all going to be on, available on demand for you to see. We're going to have a new section of our website of all the webinars we've recorded, and you can watch them at any time at your own leisure. Of course, it won't be live, but you'll still get to watch them. So, um, you know, this is our first test run of it. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying it. Um, the biggest challenge is probably just running long. That's always a challenge um, when you haven't had time to practice, but uh, I like to be, keep things informal, and I definitely like audience participation, so I really appreciate you, Stephen, um, raising your hand to ask a question here, and also helps us test the system test the system, by the way, to see how this works and uh, actually going out to somebody who has a question on the phone line. So um, any other questions or follow-up questions you have, Steve, while we got you on the phone? I'm good for now. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and put you in mute. And uh, let me check real quickly if anybody else has a question, if they want to raise their hand. If not, uh, we will move on. And uh, I, know, I know we do have another uh, poll question we'll be asking at the end. So at this point, Alan... I think we can go ahead and, and move on to the next uh, next point of discussion. Maybe it's the GMT uh, or your efforts with GMT and the project, uh, strategic partnership you have with GMT. That be, might be of interest to everybody. Okay. Well, uh, let me get to that. I want to get this thought out first. Uh, Waterloo 20, second edition, which we just launched today, uh, brings the, the old girl who kind of kicked off this whole series into the, the current state of the art uh, that the whole Waterloo system is up to. It's got the um, all the nice cards with the pictures and we'll be doing this with all our games going forward, you know, adding graphics to the cards and, and prettying them up a bit. Uh, it's got uh, the French artillery piece that people have wanted since the beginning. Where's the grand battery? Okay, well, we've got that. And, uh, and every component got touched that's in the exclusive part of the game. The exclusive rules, uh, a new scenario was added for just day three where all your pieces start deployed for the battles of Var and Waterloo. So it's, uh, it's a great little package and I'm glad the game got this upgrade. The map got a lot more of these little rivers and we fixed uh, the odd misplaced town, uh, got them in the right locations after a little more research. So it was, uh, it's really nice. This is one of uh, Victory Point Games' all-time bestsellers. It's our great little ambassador game for the company, and I was just thrilled that we got to do a second edition of it. Uh, on to GMT, the Fading Glory Quadra game, which includes uh, Waterloo, Borodino, Smolensk, and a new one uh, being released initially in that pack, um, 
Salamanca 20, which is by uh, Steve Carey. And um, that whole partnership thing kind of came about because of the Nappy 20 games, to tell you the truth. Uh, Gene Billingsley and I are old friends. Um, he said, you know, we really should try and put some of your games out. And I said, well, uh, okay, that's great. Uh, the designers own the rights, and I can help get all that negotiated and, and work together with you on it. And the first one we put out there was, of course, No Retreat. And that seems to be doing all right. Uh, GMT is really happy with sales. Carl Paradis, the designers, done a lot of support. The second thing they put out was these Quadra games, which uh, we've had our eye on for a long time. Fading Glory has made the P500 cut, and uh, we're pushing it through in production, bringing Waterloo up to second edition standards, and we'll take another look at Borodino and Smolensk, of course. And then uh, right now, uh, Salamanca 20 is in playtesting. I think that covers Oh, and let me put a footnote for beyond that. Um, Victory Point Games is, um, this is, you know, unreleased news and stuff, but we're looking at doing um, a whole series upgrade, trying to go back and retrofit all our games with the nicer looking cards. And um, we definitely have plans. We're going to be moving in March of uh, 2012, here in just a few weeks, and uh, upgrading some of our game manufacturing equipment. So hopefully we'll have um, better production values that you'll all have something to talk about uh, in April and May, and by Consum World, of course, when everything should be rolling out in, in full steam. So there's a little gossip for you right there. Lance? Well, yeah, uh, real quick on what we're doing next here. Uh, as Alan said, we're doing the uh, testing right now on Salamanca 20. Uh, it's an interesting and challenging game to design because the battle really only lasted a couple hours. It was a very intense fight, and uh, Wellington just pulled off a brilliant set of moves and completely collapsed the French at that fight. So we have to find a way to make a game that's more than two or three turns long. So we're working on approach to battle scenarios that uh, show all the options of, of different ways the French could have maneuvered, the British could have maneuvered and such. So that's a big challenge. Uh, after Salamanca, the next game in the series will be uh, Fuentes de Honoro, which will be done by Jack Gill, who's a fairly well-respected uh, author on Napoleonic uh, Wars, uh, his battle, uh, his uh, book uh, Thunder on the Danube, which is about uh, Wagram, is uh, one of the premier source books on that particular engagement, uh, which is as good as a segue as any to the next game in the series, which would be Wagram. Uh, that's another design by Kim Mites, uh, really fascinating battle. It's the second largest of the, uh, the Napoleonic Wars uh, after Leipzig. And, uh, it's interesting because we had to introduce several new kinds of bridges and we actually have a, a river that is that with the Danube that is so wide in full flood that it, it takes up a full mile wide hex. So it's, it's an interesting game from the standpoint of having to try to get across the the rapidly flowing river. Uh, that sounds pretty good to me, Lance. We also got to get uh, we got to get Germany twenty finished off at some point too. Yeah. Well, the next the next two after Fuentes de Honoro and uh, Bagram would be uh, an expansion to Bagram to do the Battle of Aspernestling. It's uh, different armies fighting on the same battlefield. Uh, and it's also a much more focused uh, attempt at crossing, just one bridge as opposed to a, about a half dozen bridges. And, uh, then the next one after that will probably be uh, the wrap-up for Germany 20, which is the entire linking campaign and also a mini-game on the Battle of Hanau, which was uh, part of the retreat of uh, the surviving elements of the Grand Armée as they fled back to France after the battle and uh, losing Leipzig. So that pretty much uh, is where we are for 
the series uh, both now and in the immediate future. I suppose that's as good a moment as any to put up the, the next poll. Thank you, John. All righty, so we've just uh, posted our, uh, this is our second and final poll question for today. So I, I want to thank uh, Lance and Alan for uh, providing these two poll questions for us today. And I, again, I realize uh, perhaps half of you haven't played uh, any of these games yet. So in that case, uh, you can go ahead and, if you wish, select not on this list. That's the same as a, as, as, as a non-interest vote uh, based on lack of playing. So if you have played these games, and there's maybe up to half of you on the phone today, Go ahead and select one of the following choices. And we just like to see how the voting is going just on select titles. And one thing we learned, by the way, is because, um, again, this is a learning experience, we can only have up to five choices when we do ask these poll questions. So that's why we couldn't list more games. So I'll wait another 15 seconds, and then we'll close this poll out. We have about 71% responding. I'll wait for another 15 seconds, and then we'll close the poll. 81%, thank you. 85, 88, oh, they're almost all done. Look at that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the polls and then share the results. And there you go. So uh, Leipzig was trying to give Waterloo 20 a run for its money, uh, Alan and Lance. Okay. According to what I see. And well, wait till they see the new Waterloo 20. It's up there with Leipzig standards now, so I... Hope everybody can fall in love with that again. I know it was great playtesting it. Well, I'm wondering what's hidden in that 70%. <laughs> All righty, I'm just going to go back here. Can you guys see my screen okay? I can see it. All right, so we've actually, I want to thank everybody. We, uh, we're going to be uh, closing this webinar shortly. I want to thank uh, Lance and Alan again for such a great job. They really uh, prepared by the seat of their pants here, and I really appreciate it. Uh, but I just want to, yes? Can, can we see if there's any uh, questions? Yes, uh, questions will, yes, questions, are, yes, we have questions. Uh, so I'm going to be getting to questions, and then we're going to close. So uh, just a reminder again, as Alan mentioned, uh, Fading Glory is the, uh, is the game that's on the GMT P500 that's already made the cut, actually. So uh, for more information on Fading Glory, please visit the GMT Games website. Here's a little screenshot of the site, which includes some videos of it. But at this point, what I'd like to do is we're going to move on to your questions. So I have a series of questions, and this went on throughout the uh, webinar. So we're going to maybe have some repeats, which I think are good anyway, just to be clear on everything. So I, have, uh, I want to thank everybody for their questions today. First question, and again, this is for Lance or Alan. This is from uh, Alan Rickberg. Do you plan to make a game on the Battle of Elau? There's I'm pretty sure Lance has that on the drawing board. You have yeah. Elau, Lance? Yeah, there's a, we have a long list where basically a number of designers have uh, pre-registered which battles in the series they want to do, and Elau is on the list. Uh, Great. When oh. we're going to get to it, that's another question. <laughs> There you go. There's 24 hours in the day, right? All right, great. Well, there's that answer. Next question comes from Noel Wright. Noel asks, after Wargram 20, are there any plans for Abensberg, Ekmol, and Osborne Essling? Um, as I said, Osborne Essling is an expansion which will be doing for Wargram. It should be, my guess, is out this year sometime. Okay. Now, this is a... Okay. Yeah, Abensberg, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it's on the list, but I don't know where it stands in the queue. Okay. Now, the next question is a serious question because we have half the audience hasn't seen, perhaps seen these games before in person. So, Alan, this question is for you. This is from Scott Hall. So this is kind of like Risk, right? Well, Scott, welcome to the world of wargaming. Um, it is kind of like Risk in that, uh, you know, the sides uh, oppose each other with armies, and they use dice to resolve the conflict. But where Risk uses a lot of abstraction with the simple wooden pieces and the large areas to represent huge swaths of the earth, <clears throat> these battle games focus down onto little actual terrain boards, and it's carved up into spaces called hexagons. And... The pieces aren't just a generic green block or a blue block. They actually represent military forces in the 
uh, Napoleonic 20 series, these would be infantry, cavalry, and sometimes artillery. And they engage in battle not just by throwing a die to see who rolls higher, but on a table that gives advantages to forces that are concentrating, are stronger, or defending key terrain features like woods or behind rivers and towns and bridges. Those things are very simply taken into account. A simple single die roll is used to resolve the battle, and it indicates whether the attacker or defender wins or loses and to what degree. They're really quite clever. The use of the cards to introduce random events and story elements really helps the narration of the battle so that you can understand what is going on in this campaign and feel the situation those historical characters did, the ones your battle. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. And uh, I think we're getting the audience really alive here. The caffeine is uh, starting to take effect because we've got Charles out there. Charles Cabell has a question that he's raised his hand for. So I am going to unmute, giving him fair and warning. I'm going to unmute his phone now so Charles can ask his next question. Uh, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah. Thank you. I am really interested in the campaign system. Always wanted to tie this thing together, and I've always wanted a game on this level that connected all the maps together and try to get a better understanding of Napoleon and how he moved through. Uh, so my my question is, how soon do you expect before the cam campaign type system will be uh, released out? Well, it would be hard to do all of Europe at this scale. You'd need a bigger house. Well, even just like smaller scales, I understand that there's different campaigns and different connections and stuff. So uh, I know other gaming systems it take a portion of like four or five maps and connect them together. But I just I really would be excited about connecting these these games because they're so light and they play so well uh, to take them to a level where you can kind of play them a little bit longer over a period of a couple games. Or you know, well, that would be Lance's bailiwick and that whole Germany Twenty subseries. It's a bunch of connected games that Lance is planning on the connection for, and he can tell you about that. Lance? Sure. Let me try to clarify that at this scale, the, the hexes are about one mile across. If we took two battles that were right near each other, for example, Grossbieren and Denowitz, we'd end up having to put about 15 to 20 of our maps end to end to get it all to fit onto one area. And that's just one small theater in the whole autumn 1813 campaign, one, one segment of the front. So having a complete overlapping set of maps isn't really practical. We were, okay. able, to do it with, we were able to do it with Dresden and Kulm because the battlefields are so near each other but the others don't work that way. But what we're envisioning doing is this idea of linked battles. So, for example, in the Germany 20 series, you play the Battle of Dresden. Depending on how the outcome at that battle goes, the French player then decides how much of his force he's going to hold in reserve to go rush off and help either his northern front, which is trying to take Berlin, or to shore up his eastern front, which is trying to stop Blucher from coming in and cutting the supply lines. Or he can just leave all those troops down in south fighting at Dresden and perhaps try to invade Bohemia. So those are each separate battlefields, but he has the, the French player has a set number of units that he can transfer between fronts, if you will. Charles, okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lance, sorry. Yeah, that, that what that does is it allows people to get a much more long-term strategic uh, feel for the campaign. All right. Well, that's a pretty, uh, okay. Well, I think, is it okay, Charles, if we move on? Is that okay for now? And we can Absolutely. Okay, that's well, great news. I'm very excited about that. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling in. I appreciate your question. So I'm going to mute your uh, phone again, and we'll move on. We have a few more questions. If anybody wants to raise their hand, we still have time for that. We have about four questions, four or five questions remaining. Uh, so this is a very interesting question from uh, Keith Brush. Uh, and here's his question, it's mainly for Alan and I think for probably Lance as well. What lessons did you learn throughout the process that made you go back to uh, Gussie up Waterloo 20? What, in other words, what was updated in Waterloo 20? What made you, what motivated you to go back to that title? Uh, let me take that one first. Uh, everything we do at Victory Point Games, at the end of it I always ask, what have we learned? Um, because we're 
education based. I teach at the Art Institute just down the street here, uh, teach game design and stuff. So I'm always asking the question, okay, we've done this, now what have we learned? For Waterloo 20, it was just a game whose time has come. I mean, now that it's in the fading glory package, this is our chance to, to bring it up to standards. And it's something we've been talking about for a long time. You know, it's just the, the system has advanced so far past the first Waterloo 20 game. And this is just a, a singular opportunity for us to sit down, you know, talk to Joe Miranda and say, okay, knowing what we know now, how would we, you know, trick this game out and make it really shine and a, and a jewel once again in the series. And then we turn it over to Lance, like we do all the other games. Lance? Yeah, well, uh, let's see. What kind of things do we do and why did we do them? Uh, there's a graphics upgrade to the card. That's pretty obvious. Uh, why did that happen? Well, just because we've got better computer, we can do fancier things. That's what we could do. But we also take player feedback into consideration. And for example, with Waterloo, one of the questions that kept getting asked by people was, "Where's the French Grand Battery? It fired on the Prussians at uh, Lingi. It fired on the British at uh, at Waterloo. Why isn't it in the game?" Well, Joe's decision when he designed the original game was that it was amalgamated into the strengths of other units. We re-looked at the situation and said, you know, we can add it in. It adds color to the game. It's an interesting thing. Of course, giving another unit to the French player changes the balance of the game. So then we had to find ways to counter-adjust for that so you still had a very delicately balanced game. That's the kind of thing that goes on. It's a combination of as the series evolves, we develop new ideas, new rules, new concepts. We want to incorporate those back into the older versions to keep them lively. Yeah, one of the ways we balanced it was to look at the, the deck of cards again. Those aren't the same 12 cards in the original game, but the cards are used to balance the game. The, the Prussians have a cavalry unit that begins eliminated and can rally. That balances the game. The fact that the Allies can find good ground to defend on, that also helps balance the game. There's, there's a lot of that went on. It was really playtest. All right. I'm going to move on. We have another question from the audience. So just, uh, again, a heads up for uh, Dennis Spores, who uh, raised his hand. I'm going to be unmuting his phone. So let's go ahead and let's hear from uh, Dennis and what question he has to ask. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? I sure can. You sound great, by the way. Oh, well, uh, I appreciate the compliment. It's not really a question. It's, it's really more of a comment. Um, I didn't know what to expect from the webinar. Neither and did we. Honestly, Neither did we. <laughs> yeah, and quite honestly, I, didn't, I had seen the games, but I didn't know much about them. And what you've presented has really uh, been very interesting to me. And I would really go check out the Leipzig and some things in 1813. I think there's some really great concepts in there. So I appreciate the webinar. I'm always interested in what other people are doing for designs. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Dennis. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we always take uh, complaints, questions, or in this case, we'll take compliments as well, equally well. So <laughs> thanks thanks for your compliment. I'll go ahead and mute your uh, your phone. I guess my check cleared with Dennis, so that's good to hear. Glad to hear that. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to go to some last, and we're going to have to go quick, guys, because we got just more questions popping in here, and we're in overtime mode. I know people got to probably get back to things, so I'm going to go quickly here. So uh, questions from uh, Lucas and Charles. They didn't see Jenna 20 listed, and they know Jenna 20 was with C3I. So is there any anything there um, they didn't uh, hear it being covered, or maybe it was covered briefly, and we, we went through it too fast? It was covered briefly. It's the one where Lance fixed the terrain map, and I, I first met him. So, yeah, we covered that at the very beginning. Okay. The uh, interesting thing about the C3I version is Roger McGowan is a good friend, and, uh, and, and he and I work out putting the odd victory point game inside C3I, and, and that was one of the ones we chose. And it seemed to have uh, been pretty well received, so that's good. Okay, great. Next question uh, from Mark Searle. Will there be games from the, from the 1814 campaign? Lance? Yes. Uh, Kim Mind says designed and submitted prototypes for at least two that I know of, and I think he's got a couple others in there as well. It's just a matter of getting the time to get to them. I think La Rothier will be the first one in the 1814 campaign. 
Great. And actually, just a point of clarification, the question about Jenna 20 was why it wasn't listed on the poll. That is that is Alan Emmerich's fault. He withdrew that <laughs> game because I have a limitation of only five answers. So that is why that that is why that occurred. So that's just a clarification on that. So yeah. Jenna was more about the poll. That's his favorite game. Sure that that was his favorite game. List until it had to be paired back to five. And that was, uh, by the way, that was he said that was his favorite game, and he couldn't vote for it. it wasn't on the list. So there oh, you go. I'm sorry, man. There you go. Next, There's yes, go ahead, Lance. Two games in this series, and if you've only limited to five titles, that's what you do. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So next question: um, How long before the campaign game is planned to be released? That question's from Charles Cabell. Lance, that one's your baby. Uh, I'm hoping to get to it. Probably by, I guess, the end of this year. Um, I, we have the commitment that we have to get uh, Salamanca done for GMT to put in Fading Glory. Um, let's see. And some of these other designers have been waiting a long time for their games to hatch. So. Yeah, sure. It, 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 it's, it's difficult to uh, explain it, but I have I have prototype designs that have been submitted and in the queue sitting in my files that are in some cases four years old. So All right. There you go. Really, it, it's not really fair to jump ahead of, of some of these people. The other By the way, that's a, that's a Victory Point games situation. Uh, even though we put something out every other week, actually a little faster now, um, we still have tons of games in the queues. Lots of new designers, lots of clever ideas. We just can't develop them all, you know, that fast. We can't put out two games a week. That's sure. They wouldn't be as good a quality. You got to be patient. Yeah. Power. But to expand on the answer to, to Germany Twenty, the other thing is, originally the intent was to include that as part of the Leipzig package, but it got too big and too confusing trying to sort all the little moving pieces out. So we decided to extract it and make it a separate kit, the expansion kit, and get Leipzig out the door now and get back to uh, the Germany 20 campaign so we could do it properly and in full style for everybody. Okay. Right. It, it's going to need some love, so we'll give it to it down at the end of the year. All right. Scott Hall has a question. Uh, what distribution channels are Waterloo 20 available through? He buys only uh, through, uh, he says, my FLGS. I don't, I'm not sure what FLGS stands for. Maybe uh, you know that. And I'd like to tell them to carry this. So, Scott, I... The only local game store would be my guess. My students text Yes, yes, time, you're right. You're right. That. Yeah, that, there you go. That's an acronym. See, I'm still learning acronyms and more, more gaming. So that's exactly what he means, I'm sure. Okay, well, we sell most of our games direct from the VictoryPointGames.com website. Uh, where the first thing you'll see right now is Waterloo 22nd edition just released today. Um, we sell our games through some other outlets, uh, uh, Cool Stuff Inc. and uh, Noble Knight. And we're just kind of here and there with a little bit of distribution. One of our goals uh, after we move and we get better manufacturing equipment is to be able to uh, bring our games so that we can actually sell them to distributors. And they're the guys who sell to your... FLGS, your friendly local game store. That's a goal for us. It's about a year away. It's the Gamma Trade Show, the Game Manufacturers Trade Show is in March. This year we won't be ready to hook up with distributors because we won't have things in place. We're putting them in place. Next year in March, we're going to make a full splash presentation at the Gamma Trade Show and try to get distributors and get into your friendly local game store. Thank we you. have a plan. We're working on it, but in between, you can always order direct from us. We have um, pretty good customer service. We, we get pretty good marks for our customers. Great. Great. Final three questions for this evening uh, from Lucas uh, Juan. Will the Fading Glory games uh, work together with uh, Victory Point Games expansions uh, or Russia, Russia 20 games? Will Fading Glory games work together with VPG expansions or Russia 20 games from Lucas Juan? Yeah, I think they're going to completely throw out all our graphics and start from scratch. So I would think not. Okay. Um, they're, the four games in that box are pretty much going to be that world. I mean, unless they put something in C3i. So I, I don't think they're being made graphically by GMT to reverse engineer and link back to the, the corpus of the Nappy 20 series that we've released. 
All right. Next question is from Steve here. Has any thought been given to the application of this game system to other wars? War of 1812, War of Independence, for example. Um, thought, yes. Uh, we really need to get an American Civil War 20 out and have been thinking about that for three years. But that's another and a longer story. We have a new game system coming out uh, by Frank Chadwick called Drums and Muskets that really handles the battles back in the American Revolution, the smaller battles where, you know, art artillery is attached and things like that, lines and columns and black powder smoke. Um, the first one is uh, Luthien, and we have that in development now. But the Drums and Musket series can handle those smaller battles um, in the Age of Reason. Great. And the final question for this evening comes from Wade Hyatt, and I think this is perfect for you, Alan, to even mention your uh, most current recent bio. And here's the question from Wade. I've always wanted to design a war game. The part of history, the part of history uh, didn't matter, but any time I sat down to think about how to go about it was struck with mental paralysis, or he was struck with mental paralysis. What's the best way to learn design and where and how to start? And I think that's a great segue for what you've been doing for the past several years and answering. Goodness, you know, I'm no game designer, even though I have a few designs to my credits. I'm, I'm much more of a game developer, taking other people's designs and running with them. What I would do if uh, if I were you, is I would find a game that's a natural series game, like uh, Napoleonic 20 or the Drums and Muskets I just mentioned, and say, oh, well, now that I know the standard rules and they're all cooked up, and all i got to do is create my game with its map, order of battle, and exclusive rules for that game, I can work within that. So you're doing half a design. The, the core mechanics are all invented for you, so you're not just staring at a, at a blank piece of paper and wondering how the heck do I make this work. But building a new game in a series is a great way to start. And we've introduced a lot of new game designers with like our State to Siege game series and stuff. The other thing you could do is, at shilling away, at the Victory Point Games website, I've created, if you click on the articles button, I've, there's a 15 part series called Make a VPG, Make a Victory Point Game. And it gives you, uh, guidelines for what, how to think in terms of rules, how to think about your counters, how to think about charts and tables, ways to look at it philosophically as a game designer should. Now this is you know, high level stuff and, and if you make a game we sure hope you come to us and because uh, we'll work with you. We'll teach you as we go along. We're, we're all in this together. We're learning together. Everybody here is both teacher and student and we all try and help each other out. Great. And uh, before we close, any final words uh, for the audience, uh, Alan and Lance? I thought this was a wonderful experience, John. I hope these webinars uh, inspire others to do them for uh, Consum World. This is going to be great. I see it like a podcast with pictures, and I can't wait to find out what the future ones are going to be. Thank you. Fun, John. Thank, thanks for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Lance McMillan and Alan Emmerich of Victory Point Games for our first webinar. And again, it was really a trial by fire, so I really thank them for stepping up and uh, doing this presentation. We learned a lot tonight. Uh, just to let you know, just some basic housekeeping, when this webinar is finished, we do have a survey that should launch where we're going to ask you just a few questions to help us improve the overall experience and also to get ideas of what topics you would like to see covered in the future. And again, all my thanks goes to you because of uh, your donations and support to Consum World. We're able to try this new uh, vehicle of promoting and supporting our hobby. So I want to thank you all. I want to wish you all a good night. And we will announce future webinars via the Consum World News Desk. We'll see you at Consum World Expo. That's right. Yeah, definitely.